for those who've been around for a while, you know that I've, I guess you'd call it kind of a nerdy side of me. And with that, I happen to be a big fan of The Lord of the Rings, uh, the movies, the books, uh, whatever, just very fascinated by those stories. And if you've seen the movies or read the books, you are familiar with some of the different characters, one of them, them being Gandalf, uh, the wizard in the story. Now, as you go through the books, whether it be The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, you find that there's something true about Gandalf. And that is when Gandalf knocks on your door, it's not just for a cup of tea. When Gandalf knocks on your door, you, you know that your life is about to drastically change because he's going to take you on some adventure. In fact, at the beginning of the, the story of The Hobbit, where Gandalf is trying to talk to the hobbit Bilbo Baggins about going on this journey to help the dwarves and fight off the, the dragon smog, he has this conversation with this timid hobbit, and Gandalf tells Bilbo that you'll have a tale or two to tell when you come back. And Bilbo says back, you can promise me that I'll come back. To which Gandalf says, no. And if you do, you'll not be the same. When Gandalf shows up, everything changes. Now, I want to be very clear before I move forward, because I don't want you running out of here saying, Pastor Paul says that Gandalf is the Holy Spirit in the stories. No, it's, I'm just very similar bouncing off point. As you go through the book of Acts, if you read through the book of Acts this week, you find that when the Holy Spirit shows up, everything changes. Nothing is the same once the Spirit of God comes uh, upon a people. And so we're going to see this uh, coming through the book of Acts. And we're going to actually be looking at several different passages in the book of Acts. Uh, put most of them up on the, the wall so you don't have to flip through all of them. But we're going to start in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And hopefully as we go through Acts, and as you read through Acts, as I mentioned last week, as you look at the Gospels, everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus did, you begin to see this seamless transition to the book of Acts where it, the same ministry just continues on now as the Holy Spirit works through the disciples uh, throughout the book of Acts. But Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Verse 42 starts off with these four things that describe how they devoted themselves, what they devoted themselves to. And so let me jump back here. Uh, first of all, it says they devoted themselves. I just want to stick on that phrase right there because the word devoted means to adhere to or give unremitting care to a thing. And as you look at the grammar, you find out that, again, these aren't simply things that, oh, by the way, as these disciples gathered, they happened to do this. Rather, it's these are defining qualities of the gatherings of the believers at that time. These were actions that defined their very existence, if you will, and it rattles off four of them for us. First of all, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, maybe say, well, that's wonderful, but it doesn't really tell us what the apostles taught them. But we are told that, by the way. In Matthew 28, when Jesus gives the Great Commission, he gives the blueprint. It was, sometimes we focus on the go make disciples of all nations part and preach the gospel to every creature part. But Jesus also gives this element of instruction in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, where it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And so we can insert there here in Acts chapter 2 to find out, okay, what are the apostles teaching the Christians? Well, everything that Jesus taught the apostles. The apostles are now in turn passing on to the disciples, part of the, the great commission that Jesus gave them. And so as they begin to meet after Jesus ascends to heaven, the early Christians are defined by listening to the apostles teach them what Jesus taught the apostles in those some three years of his earthly ministry. But not only do they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, it also says they devoted themselves to the fellowship to the koinonia, to the joint participation, to the intimacy of their relationships together. Again, following off of what Jesus built on in the Gospel of John, John chapter 17, verse 21, in the high priestly prayer, he says, 
that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. In John 13, 35, just earlier that evening, Jesus says, By all this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So these two different times on the same night, Jesus says to the disciples, first of all, people are going to know that you are my followers based on the love that you have for each other. And then later that night, as he's praying to the Father, he's praying that they would be one. And it's interesting what Jesus uses in John 17 about what that's going to look like. We think about the mystery of the Trinity and the unity of the Trinity and how that all works together, that we've got... God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons, yet one God, three distinct individuals, one God. But that's the platform with, with which Jesus says, Father, may they be one. May your people be one, just as we are one. I don't know exactly how that works or exactly what that means for us in terms of our love for each other, but essentially, here's the bottom line of what Jesus is praying. Father, may they love each other the way that you and I love each other. May they be united the way that we are united. And I'm not fully sure that any of us has ever truly seen the reality of what Jesus prayed for. But that's where the disciples were heading towards. It was a process that they were working towards. They were devoted by their intimacy together, by their interconnectedness together. Now, sometimes we can dismiss that and say, well, they needed that. You know, they're in a world of persecution, they've got to stick together. And there is that element of it. But it's more than that. Do you think that Jesus prayed in John 17, may they be one because they're going to face hard times, but once the hard times are over, then they can kind of disperse and do their own thing. We take that word fellowship. And it's a neat little word, you know, fellowship. It sounds great. It's kind of fun to say, fellowship. You know, we get fancy and say, well, the Greek is koinonia. That's even funner to say. But what does it mean? Does it mean that from 10.30 to 11.45 on Sunday mornings, we all happen to be in the same room and we really love that we're all there together and we, we like to greet each other and say hi and catch up, but then that's the end of it? It's an interconnectedness. It's a fellowship. It's an intimacy. That it's not just about them occupying the same place at the same time, but it's their lives being intertwined together. Expressing the same unity that is found in the Trinity. And again, I don't understand that or know what that means, but that's what Jesus prayed for. Are we that connected? Are we defined by having that kind of connectedness together? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. There would be this sharing of a meal, and then they'd celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Now, we're kind of doing that in a prolonged sense. We had our agape meal last week, and this morning is the communion, but for them it would be this one big package. And you read about that in 1 Corinthians 11 with all the problems that they had. They weren't waiting for each other, and they were helping themselves, and, and then goes into talking about communion. It was this one event together, this breaking of bread, sharing the meal, but also celebrating the Lord's table together. Why do we do that? You know, the first Sunday of the month, why, why do we have communion ready? It's... Because of this. Do this in remembrance. Of, I don't know if you can read what's on there, but do it, remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. That Jesus said, every time you do this, you're to do it in remembrance of me, to turn your hearts, to turn your minds back to me. You say, well, why in the world do they need that? You know, why do they need to remember Jesus? I mean, thinking if I'm them, it'd be pretty hard to forget him. I don't think it's Jesus worried about them forgetting him but in the process of remembering Him, putting Him first in their lives again. That readjustment period. Because I think all of us are, are prone to get distracted. We're all prone to drift and kind of fall into our routines. You know, with tonight being the Super Bowl, and both coaches, I can almost guarantee you, I'm, I'm not going to be in the locker room, but I'm guessing both coaches are going to instill the same message in their teams. And that is get back to the basics, focus on the basics, block, tackle, don't get sloppy. And I remember playing, play, playing football having that same speech. Because when you're in the middle of a game, you're just caught up in the emotions and the activity of the game, and it seems so obvious where you're supposed to tackle, you're supposed to block, but when you're in the middle of a game, sometimes you forget the fundamentals. 
And when you forget the fundamentals, everything falls apart. And Jesus is saying, do this in remembrance of me. Keep him first. So that it's repeated reminder, put Jesus first, put Jesus first, put Jesus first. I shared a few months ago, it's like one of the workouts that I go through. The instructor is always saying, breathe, breathe. Now, initially, like, well, duh, if I don't, I'm going to die. Why does he keep saying breathe? Because your tendency in working out is to hold your breath and strain. Reminding you, breathe. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember Jesus. Keep Jesus first. Because in the midst of our lives, even in the midst of our Christian lives, our focus can shift off of Jesus onto other things. As we go through the book of Acts, we see that Jesus Christ is their theme. Jesus is the message that they proclaim. Uh, some of the scriptures that come up with this. Chapter 5, verse 42, teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Chapter 8, verse 5, they proclaim to them the Christ. Chapter 9, verse 35, told him the good news about Jesus. Chapter 10, verse 42, testify, testify that he is the one appointed by God. 11.20, preaching the Lord Jesus. Chapter 17, verse 18, he was preaching Jesus. Chapter 18, verse 5, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Chapter 28, verse 23, trying to convince them about Jesus. Chapter 28, verse 31, teaching them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was the message that they preached over and over and over throughout the book of Acts. You say, well, yeah, of course. You know, that, that's our message. Our message is Jesus. Are we so sure about that? As American Christians, are we so sure that our message is clearly Jesus? Because a lot of times we add so many other things alongside of Jesus that I think our message tends to get muddied up. That all of a sudden, the, the distinction between Jesus and our politics begins to get blurred. Now, political action is important, and there's a role that we're to have in that. We have to be careful that Jesus and our politics don't begin to shadow each other so that you can't distinguish what is our message. Is our message conservative social values? Is our message conservative financial or, or economic positions? Is our message pro-life? Is our message, what's our message on same-sex marriage? Is it important to have positions on those things? Yes. But is that our message? Our message is Jesus. Everything else has to fall underneath that. But sometimes when we try to put them all on equal plane, it gets confusing. What is our actual message? Is the message Jesus? We, if we can give ourselves the test, you know, who's the hope of this world? Well, oh, Jesus. But isn't it interesting that all of our passion for Jesus can kind of be pushed to the side and we put our effort and our energy and our attention on who's going to be in the White House, who's going to be in Congress, who's going to be a, a mayor or a governor. Vote. Be involved in that process. But who's the hope of the world? Who's the light of the world? Who's the answer? Jesus. Is our message Jesus? They were devoted to breaking bread. They were devoted to the remembrance of Jesus and keeping Jesus first. But they're also devoted to the prayers at the end of verse 42. Again, as we look through the Gospels, hopefully one of the things that you saw throughout the Gospels was Jesus, of all the things Jesus was, one of them, He was a man of prayer. He defined a life of prayer. We see this theme coming up throughout the book of Acts. Just a few of the many examples in the book of Acts. Chapter 1, verse 14, we saw that they were devoting themselves to prayer. Uh, we just read in Acts 2.42. Chapter 4, verse 24, they lifted up their voices together to God. Chapter 4, verse 31, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. Chapter 6, verse 6, they prayed. Chapter 9, verse 40, Peter knelt down and prayed. Chapter 12, verse 5, earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Chapter 13, verse 3, after fasting and praying. Chapter 16, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Chapter 20, verse 36, he knelt down and prayed. Chapter 21, verse 5, kneeling down on the beach, we prayed. Chapter 28, verse 8, Paul visited him and prayed. But over and over and over throughout the book of Acts, one of the, the themes that we see woven is these are a people of prayer. Now, it's interesting, as you look at these four qualities, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. 
Now, if you look back at chapter 1, as you read through chapter 1, you may have come to one observation. And that is, you can make a case just on chapter 1 that they were already doing these things before Pentecost. Before the Spirit was poured out, they were doing these things. The apostles were teaching them, and that's the basis by which they decided they had to find a replacement for Judas, was because well, this is what Scripture says, this is what we ought to do. They were doing these things before Pentecost. But again, when the Holy Spirit shows up, everything changes. Now these things that they were doing before Pentecost, which were good things, now the Spirit of God sets these things on fire and brings life to them. And that's where we begin to see what happens starting at verse 43. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Awe came upon every soul. There was a reverence that came upon every soul. As they began to see the things that God was doing, people were at times a little bit freaked out. As you go through the book of Acts, you see a very interesting response to the things that God is doing by His Spirit. People are sometimes just a little bit freaked out. That even though people might refute the message, they might refute these Christians as fanatical, the one thing they couldn't escape was what God was doing. And there was a sense of reverence that came upon people based on what God was doing. But that says, and many wonders and signs are being done through the apostles. It's a very interesting verse, and I'm not going to try to draw a conclusion on this or offer suggestions, but a couple of verses stood out to me in Acts. One of them, Acts 6, verse 8, where it says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So here's some dude who's not an apostle. He was, he was appointed a deacon. You know, he's appointed to serve food. That was his job. And the next thing we know, he's preaching, he's doing these miracles, and he's being stoned to death. What happened there? I don't know, but it did. Acts chapter 14, verse 3. Speaking of Paul and Barnabas, it says, They remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Paul and Barnabas. Where did Barnabas get thrown into this mix? If you notice chapter 14, verse 4, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul. All the times I've memorized a list of apostles, I've never once put Barnabas' name on there. Apostles, Barnabas and Paul. What? I'm not trying to draw conclusions, draw assumptions. Just I don't know what all that means. So I'll let you wrestle through that in terms of uh, what the apostles were in the book of Acts. But verses 44 and 45. It says, And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. We see a clear evidence of this in chapter 4. At the end of chapter 4, it makes this brief mention that we, we forget about, but Barnabas sells some property and takes his proceeds and brings that to the apostles so the apostles can distribute that to meet the needs among the believers. We typically associate this with chapter 5 where we get Ananias and Sapphira who do the exact same thing, but instead of taking all the money and bringing it to the apostles, they kept some for themselves. And sometimes we come to the conclusion that where they sinned and why they were struck dead was because they kept some for themselves. And Peter makes it clear. They could have done whatever they wanted with the money. They had no obligation to give it away. It was up to them. Where they fell into sin was that they presented the money and said, we're giving all the money we got. That's where they fell into sin. They lied. They lied to God. They lied to the Holy Spirit. And both of them dropped dead. Now, it's fascinating as you look through that account, if you forget about it, I would encourage you to read through it this week. If that happened here, and one person in this church was caught in a lie, and right here on a Sunday morning, they dropped dead because of that lie, I'm guessing next Sunday, attendance might be a little low. I mean, if, if one little sin, God's going to strike you dead in front of all of us, I'm thinking a lot of us might be home next Sunday. But as you look through that account, what happens is it continues to grow. It grows. It's the opposite of what I think happens. But because there's a seriousness, there's a reverence, there's an awe of what's happening, in response to that, things begin to grow. But the point of it here is they're selling their possessions and their belongings and distributing their proceeds to all as any had need. See, this isn't just a, a situation where the believers, they get together and say, oh, so-and-so is having a hard time. Boy, you know, let's pray for them. Or, you know, oh, I, I 
I've got a couple extra bucks. Let me give that to you. This is a story of people saying, wow, you, you need a hundred bucks. Um, if I sell my shoes, that'll give me 20. If I sell my watch, maybe a, another 10. But what can you sell? How can, what can we get rid of so that we can meet your need? That blows my mind. It's one thing to say, well, I've got some extra I can give here or there. But this is going out of their way to say, what of mine can I get rid of to help meet your lack? Where does that come from? That's not because they're just so one, such wonderful people. It's because when the Holy Spirit shows up, everything changes. Priorities change. Values change. Perspectives change. Everything changes. And they now begin to go out of their way to sacrificially give up what they have so they can meet the needs of those around them. Verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. And verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. You know, we can almost get lost in what verse 47 says. We're praising God and having favor with all the people. That you can almost have this image of the book of Acts of these people are so on fire for Jesus, so reflecting Jesus, that everybody, you know, they just walk down the street and neighbors just, well, bravo. I just messed everything up there, didn't I? You know, bravo, that's so wonderful. You're just, oh, you're wonderful people. But what do we see? We see two different responses to the, the believers in the book of Acts. There's people who hate them, who are trying to see them arrested. We see before the Apostle Paul is converted, he is hunting them down so that they can be arrested and some of them put to death. We forget about, you know, we want to go back to the, the Church of Acts. We want to go back to be more like the Church of Acts. Well, you're going to get some of that. You're going to get that response of people hating you and wanting to be rid of you. Well, there's also a very positive response. I'm not even sure what button I hit there to mess that up. but Anyway, not important. But there's also this positive response to what God is doing. And this is the part that also fascinates me. Yes, there's this negative response we can't ignore, that if we want to see the church of Acts, we're going to see that too. But there's also this positive response, which tells me there's no neutral response. You're going to have to search long and hard in Acts to find a neutral response to what God is doing. It's either one or the other. They hate it or they respond to it. Chapter 2, verse 41 says, There were added that day 3,000 souls. Chapter 5, verse 14, More than ever believers were added to the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 1, The disciples were increasing in number. Chapter 6, verse 7, The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Chapter 9, verse 31, The church multiplied. Chapter 11, verse 21, A great number who believed turned to the Lord. Chapter 11, verse 24, a great many people were added to the Lord. Chapter 14, verse 1, a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Chapter 16, verse 5, they increased in number daily. Chapter 17, verse 12, many of them therefore believed. Chapter 18, verse 8, many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Chapter 28, verse 23, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. When the Holy Spirit shows up, everything changes. The believers now filled with the Spirit of God are going into the world preaching Jesus, proclaiming Jesus, living for Jesus, and there's no neutral response to that. People either hate it or they respond to it. They react negatively in great numbers and they respond positively in great numbers. And I don't know how that challenges you, but it challenges me. Because I thought about, okay, here we are on East Look Road and Rocky River. If suddenly our church disappeared, would anybody on this street care? Would anybody in the Rocky River care that we're here or not here? Is there a neutral response in this community to our existence? Because in the book of Acts, you don't find that. You find if, if the, the believers in Acts were here, what you'd see is either the people living on the street throwing tomatoes at the building every, every day, or you'd see people coming to Christ for salvation. That's the two extremes I see throughout the book of Acts. I think about my life. How many people in my life are neutral to the fact that I'm a Christian? It doesn't affect them one way or the other. It should. 
it should cause them to hate me? Or it should cause them to respond to Christ and surrender to Christ? Why is there a neutral response? As the Spirit of God was working in Acts, there wasn't a neutral response. It was vicious hatred or complete surrender to Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who made the difference. Again, it's hard to miss the the theme of the Holy Spirit throughout the book of Acts. Chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 5, verse 31, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 6, verse 5, Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Chapter 8, verse 29, the Holy Spirit said to Philip. Chapter 8, verse 39, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. Chapter 10, verse 19, the Spirit said to Peter. Chapter 10, verse 44, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Chapter 11, verse 15, the Holy Spirit fell on them. Chapter 11, verse 24, Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 13, verse 2, the Holy Spirit said. Chapter 13, verse 9, Paul filled with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 13, verse 52, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 19, verse 6, the Holy Spirit came on them. Chapter 21, verse 11, thus says the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is mentioned at least 55 times specifically throughout the book of Acts. That's a lot. For 28 chapters, that's a lot. The Holy Spirit made the difference. When the Holy Spirit shows up, everything changes. Now, the problem is for us, when I say absence of the Holy Spirit, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit's not in our lives or not in our church, but the lack of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. When there is a lack of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, we are tempted to fill that void with something else. One way we try to fill that void is we replace it with political action. Let's legislate Christianity to some degree or another. Let's get politicians who will mandate Christian behaviors. And then, you know, we'll see the book of Acts. As you went through the book of Acts, how much political action were the believers involved in? It doesn't say that they were separate from the process or never participated in the process. It wasn't their mission. It wasn't their purpose. Their purpose was to proclaim Jesus Christ. As believers, there's nothing wrong with our being involved in politics, but our mission is Jesus Christ. Our message is Jesus Christ. Everything else must fall under that, and we can't fall into the mentality that our our nation is falling into sin, we're turning away from God, so if we get the right guy elected, there'll be revival. It will never happen that way. I can't think of any time where it has ever happened that way. It's not about getting the right guy elected. So what we need is more education. We need more information. Classes are great. I'm a huge fan of education. I love education. I love books. But there's that danger of thinking, the more I know about the book of Acts, the more the book of Acts will be true. Here's one thing for us to wrestle with. We know more than the believers in the book of Acts. We have more theology books at our disposal, more ministry books at our disposal, the internet at our disposal. We've heard more sermons than the believers in the book of Acts. We have information more than what we know what to do with. Yet we don't see what the book of Acts saw. Information is good, classes are good, education is good, but it cannot replace the activity of the Holy Spirit in the midst of believers. We try to duplicate the fruit of Acts. Well, let's do what they did. Say what they said. And we'll see the book of Acts. It's the same mentality of let's do what Spurgeon did. We'll see what Spurgeon saw. It doesn't work that way. Because we forget that everything that happens throughout the book of Acts all sprung out of a prayer meeting. It all was birthed out of what God did at Pentecost. As they're gathered together praying and the Spirit of God is poured out, that's what now is the catalyst for everything else that happened. We can go back and duplicate what they did. It doesn't mean we're doing what they did, if that makes sense. We can imitate their actions, but it doesn't mean we're imitating their power. Because without the Spirit of God doing it through us, it's just us. Putting on a performance. Doing some really neat things, but at the end of the day, seeing no life, no fruit, nothing of any value. We can duplicate the fruit. It doesn't mean we have the same life in the tree. We can throw programs in the place of the Holy Spirit. Let's just busy ourselves with stuff. And we see this trend in the Christian publishing industry. We're always looking for that next new book, that next big thing. 
you know, here's the, the 40 day book to take your church through, and that's going to ignite everything. And it's great for a couple weeks, and then we go right back to how we work. This one now, this is the book. You know, 40 days through this book, 30 days through this one, that's going to change your life. We just keep throwing programs and more stuff. This is why so many conferences and seminars and retreats fall flat because we need what we need is another conference, another retreat. That's going to do it. But again, if nothing is ever done with it, it's just it was a great day that you had. More programs, more stuff, more events is not going to duplicate what they saw in the book of Acts. What they saw in the book of Acts was this one simple reality. When the Holy Spirit shows up, everything changes. Now, you're maybe running through these theological circles in your mind saying, well, yes, but as a Christian, I have the Holy Spirit. So what do you mean the Holy Spirit showing up? I've got the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit have you? Does the Holy Spirit have control of your life? Or do you have control of your life? If you're anything like me, I, I kind of came from a background where we kind of talked about the Holy Spirit, but not too much. You know, one of those things where if you ever, if you talk about your own death, you're like, oh, don't say that, it might happen. You know, don't talk about the Holy Spirit, he might actually come. You know, just keep him in the book. You know, he's that person in the book, we'll acknowledge him in our theological statement, but don't talk about him. Goodness sake, don't invite him anywhere. He'll mess everything up. Sometimes we approach the Holy Spirit that way. We've got, we've got him articulate our theology, but you know, just stay there, please, because when you show up and do stuff, it gets really weird. And it gets squirmy. I'm not quite sure what to do with it. And so we kind of we put the Holy Spirit on a leash and just stay over here. Does the Holy Spirit have control of your life? It's not that you don't have the Holy Spirit. It's that you've kind of got the Holy Spirit in the guest room. And say, oh, don't don't come in the kitchen. Please don't use these towels in the bathroom. Don't. Just we put all these restrictions on him. Rather than, I mean, we have no problem with saying, you know, coming to God the Father, saying, Lord, I give you everything. Jesus, I give you everything. Is the Holy Spirit any less God? Do we say, Holy Spirit, I give you everything? Well, oh no, that gets that gets weird. <laughs> but our problem is, we see all these abuses. And all these things that people blame on the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit really doesn't have anything to do with. And we're so afraid of being that that we come over here and just, just don't talk about him. It kind of like rumble stills can if you say his name, it'll actually come or something, a weird thing like that. Why are we so afraid of the Holy Spirit? Why are we so afraid of the Holy Spirit having his way in us, filling us, working through us? That's what the book of Acts is. As you read it this week, that's what you read. What happens when the Holy Spirit shows up? Now, I know you get all these things about, yeah, but does that mean I'm going to have this miraculous handkerchief that I can use to heal people? I'm not saying that's going to happen to us. As we talked about Wednesday at prayer meeting, there, there's all that stuff in Acts we're not quite sure what to do with. The handkerchiefs and the shadows and all those things. And then there's what I think most of us experience as Christians. I think somewhere here in the middle... It's something worth striving for. Oh God, I don't know what it's going to look like for your Holy Spirit just to have His way in my life, to fill me to overflowing. Lord, all I know is I'm not seeing that in my life right now. I'm not seeing that. Well, know a tree by its fruit. Is the fruit of the Spirit there in evidence? Is the fruit of the Spirit evident in us as a church? Is the Holy Spirit having His way in us as a church? Changing our lives. So often as Christians, we go year after year after year, same struggles, same problems, just we're the same. Where do we see that in the book of Acts? Where Christians just stay stagnant and stay the same. When the Holy Spirit shows up, everything changes. Our lives change. Is He changing us? Is He having His way among us? Let's pray.